Chapter 1 It was a good day to be free of prison. The mechanical whoosh and greasy smell of the opening bus doors greeted Aloysius Archer as he breathed free air for the first time in a while. He wore a threadbare, single-breasted brown victory suit with peak lapels that he'd bought from the Sears Roebuck catalog before heading off to war. The jacket was shorter than normal, and there were no pleats or cuffs to the pants because that all took up more material than the war would allow. There was no belt for the same reason. A string tie, a fraying wrinkled white shirt, and scuffed lace-up size 12 plain Oxford shoes completed the only wardrobe he owned. Small clouds of dust rose off his footwear as he trudged to the bus. His pointed chocolate brown fedora with a dented crown had a loop of faded burgundy silk around it. He'd bought the hat after coming back from the war, one of the few times he'd splurged on anything. But a global victory over evil had seemed to warrant it. These were the clothes he'd worn to prison, and now he was leaving in them. He comically lamented that in all this time, the good folks of the correctional world had not seen fit to clean or even press them. And his hat held stains that he hadn't brought with him to incarceration. Yet a man couldn't go around without a hat. The pants hung loosely around his waist, a waist grown slimmer and harder while he'd been locked up. He was fully 25 pounds heavier than when he'd gone into prison. But the extra weight was all muscle, grafted onto his arms, shoulders, chest, back, and legs, like thickened vines on a mature tree. In his socks, he was exactly six feet, one and a quarter. The army had measured him years before. They were quite adept at calculating height, though they had too frequently failed to supply him with enough ammunition for his M1 rifle or food for his belly, while he and his fellow soldiers were trying to free large patches of the world from an oddball collection of deranged men. The prison had a rudimentary gym of which he'd taken full advantage. It wasn't just to build up his body. When he was pumping weights or running or working his gut, it allowed him to forget for a precious hour or two that he was squirreled away in a cage with felonious men. The prison also held a book depository, teeming with tattered coverless books that sported missing pages at inopportune times. But they were precious to him nonetheless. His favorites had been westerns, where the man got the gal, and detective novels, where the man got the gal and also caught the bad guy, which he supposed was a funny sort of way for a prisoner to be entertained. Yet he liked the puzzle component of the mystery novels. He tried to solve them before he got to the end and found that as time went on, he had happened upon the correct solution more often than not. The jail grub he had pretty much done without. What wasn't spoiled or wormy held no discernible taste to persuade him to ingest it. He'd gotten by in a variety of fruits picked from a nearby orchard, vegetables harvested from the small garden inside the prison walls, and the occasional piece of fried chicken or soft bread and clots of warm apple fritters that arrived at the prison in mysterious ways. Some said they were dropped off by compassionate ladies, either looking to do good or else hoping for a husband in three to five years. The rest of his time was spent either busting big rocks into smaller ones using sledgehammers, collecting trash along the side of the roads, only to see it back the next day, or else digging ditches to nowhere fast, because a man with a double-barreled shotgun, sunglasses, a wide-brimmed hat, and a stone-cold stare told him that was all he was good for. He was not yet 30, was never married, and had no children. But one glance in the mirror showed a man who seemed older, his skin baked brown by the sun and further aged by being behind bars the rest of the time. A world war, coupled with the brutal experience of losing one's liberty, had left their indelible marks on him. These two experiences had successfully robbed him of the remainder of his youth, but hardened him in ways that might at some point work out in his favor. His hair had been long going into prison, on the first day, they had a cut army short. Then he tried to grow a beard. They shaved that off, too. They said something about lice and hiding places for contraband. He vowed never to cut his hair again, or at least to go as long as possible without doing so. It was a small thing, to be sure. He had started out life concentrated only on achieving large goals. Now he was focused on just getting by. 
the impossibly difficult ambitions had been driven from him. On the other hand, the mundane seemed reasonably doable for Archer. He ducked his head and swept off his fedora to avoid colliding with the ceiling of the rickety vehicle. The bus doors closed with a hiss and a thud, and he walked down the center aisle, a suddenly free man looking for unencumbered space. The rocking bus was surprisingly full. Well, perhaps not surprisingly. He assumed this mode of transport was the only way to get around. This was not the sort of land where they built airfields or train depots. And those black ribbons of state highways never seemed to get rolled out in these places. It was the sort of area where folks did not own a vehicle that could travel more than 50 miles at any given time. Nor did the folks driving said vehicles ever want to go that far anyway. They might fall off the edge of the earth. The other passengers looked as bedraggled as he, perhaps more so. Maybe they'd been behind their own sorts of bars that day, while he was leaving his. They were all dressed in pre-war clothes, or close to it, with dirty nails, raw eyes, hungry looks, and not even a glimmer of hope in the bunch. That surprised him, since they were now a few years removed from a wondrous global victory, and things were settling down. But then again, victory did not mean that prosperity had suddenly rained down upon all parts of the country. Like anything else, some fared better than others. It seemed he was currently riding with the others. They all stared up at him with fear, or suspicion, or sometimes both running seamlessly together. He saw not one friendly expression in the crowd. Perhaps humankind had changed while he'd been away. Or then again, maybe it was the same as it had always been. He couldn't tell just yet. He hadn't gotten his land legs back. Archer spotted an empty seat next to an older man in threadbare overalls over a stained undershirt. A stubby straw hat perched in his lap, brogans the size of babies on his feet, and a large canvas bag clutched in one calloused hand. He had watched Archer bug-eyed for the whole time it took him to reach his seat. An instant before Archer's bottom hit the stained fabric of the chair, the other man let himself go wide, splaying out like a pot boiling over forcing Archer to ride on the edge, and uncomfortably so. Still, he didn't mind. While his prison cell had been bigger than the space he was now occupying, he had shared it with four other men, and not a single one of them was going anywhere. But now, now I'm going somewhere. Joint stop. What's that? Asked Archer, eyeballing the man looking at him now. His seatmate's hair was going white, and his mustache and beard had already gone all the way there. He got on at the prison stop. Did I now? Yeah, you did. How long did you do in the can? Archer turned away and looked out the windshield into the painful glare of sunshine and the vast sky over the broad plains ahead that was unblemished by a single cloud. Long enough. Hey, you don't happen to have a smoke I can bum. You can't really borrow a smoke, now can you? and you can't smoke on here anyways. The hell you say? The man pointed to a handwritten sign on cardboard hanging overhead that said this very thing. More rules. Archer shook his head. I've smoked on a train, on a Navy ship, and in a damn church. My old man smoked in the waiting room when I was being born, so they told me. And he said my mom had a palm mall in her mouth when I came out. What's the deal here, friend? They've had trouble before, see? Like what? Like some knucklehead fell asleep smoking and caught a whole dang bus on fire. Right. Ruin it for everybody else. Ain't good for you anyway, I believe, said the man. Most things not good for me I enjoy every now and again. What'd you do to get locked up? Kill a man? Archer shook his head. Never killed anybody. Guess they all say that. Guess they do. Guess you were innocent. No, I did it, admitted Archer. Did what? Killed a man. Why? He was asking too many questions of me. But Archer smiled, so the man didn't appear too alarmed at the veiled threat. Where you headed? Somewhere that's not here, said Archer. He took off his jacket, carefully folded it, 
and laid it on his lap with his hat on top. Is all you got the clothes on your back? All I got. What's your ticket say? Archer dug into his pocket and pulled it out. It was 80 and dry outside, and about 100 inside the bus, even with the windows half down. The created breeze was like oven heat, and the mingled odors were peculiar. And yet Archer didn't really sweat, not anymore. Prison had been far hotter, far more peculiar. His pores and sense of smell had apparently recalibrated. Poker City, he read off the flimsy ticket. Never been there, but I hear it's growing like gangbusters. Used to be the boondocks, but then it went from cattle pasture to a real town. People coming out this way after the war, you see. And what do they do once they get there? Anything they can, brother, to make ends meet. Sounds like a plan good as another. The older man studied him. Were you in the war? You looked like you were. I was. Seen a lot of the world, I bet? I have. Not always places I wanted to be. I've been out of this state exactly one time. Went to Texas to buy some cattle. Never been to Texas. Hey, you been to New York City? Yes, I have. The man sat up straighter. You have? Archer casually nodded his head. Passed through there on account of the war. Seen the Statue of Liberty. Been to the top of the Empire State Building. Rode the rides over Coney Island. Even seen some rockets walking down the street in their get-ups and all. The man licked his lips. Tell me something. Are their legs like they say, friend? Better. Gams like Betty Grable and faces like Lana Turner. Damn! What else? He asked eagerly. Had a box lunch in the middle of Central Park. Sat on a blanket with a honey worked at Macy's department store. We drank sodas, and then she slipped out a flask from the top of her stocking. What was in there? Well, it was better than grape soda, I can tell you that. We had a nice day, and a better night. The man scratched his cheek. So, what are you doing all the way out here, then? Life has a crazy path sometimes. And like you said, folks heading this way after the war. The man, evidently intrigued now by his companion, sat up straighter, allowing Archer more purchase on his seat. And the war was a long time ago, or seems it anyway, said Archer, stretching out. But you got one life, right? Unless somebody's been lying to me. Hold on now, church says we get two lives. One now, one after we're dead, eternal. Don't think that's in the cards for me. Man never knows. No, I think I know. Archer tipped his head back, closed his eyes, and grabbed his first bit of shut-eye as a free man in a long time. Chapter Two Archer got off at Polka City seven hours later and too many stops in between to remember. People had gotten on and people had gotten off. They'd had a dinner and bathroom break at a roadside diner with an outhouse in the back, both of which looked only a stiff breeze away from falling over. It was nearly eight in the evening now. He stood there as the bus in the rube with too many queries and the remaining nervous folks clutching all they owned, sped off into the night chasing pots of gold along dusty roads with nary a helpful leprechaun in sight. Good riddance to them all, thought Archer. And then a second later, his more charitable consideration was, well, good luck to them. We all needed luck now and then, was his firm belief. And maybe right now he needed it more than most. The point was, would he get it? Or will I have to make my own damn luck and hope for no bad luck as a chaser? He put on his hat and then his jacket and looked around. He was in Polka City because the DOP said it was here he had to serve as parole. He dragged out the pages he'd been given. In fat, bold typeface at the top of the page was Department of Prisons, or the DOP. Below that was a long list of don'ts and a far shorter list of do's. These rules would govern his life for the next three years. Though he was free, it was a liberty with lassos attached, with so-called legal conditions that he mostly could make neither head nor tail of. Who knew prison could stick to you? Like running into a spider's web in the morning, flailing about, just wanting to be free of the tendrils, 
while alarmed that a poisonous thing was coming for you. Archer had been released from prison well before he served his full sentence, due to time off for good behavior and also for passing muster at his first parole board meeting. He had ventured into the little stuffy room that held a flimsy table with three chairs behind and one chair in front, and him not knowing what to expect. Two burly prison guards had accompanied him to this meeting. He had been dressed in his prison duds, which seemed to shriek guilt and continued danger from each pore of the sweat-stained fabric. Behind the table were three people, two men and one woman. The men were short and stout and freely perspiring in the closeness of the room. They looked self-important and bored as they greedily puffed on their fat cigars. The woman, who sat in the middle of this little band of freedom givers or takers, was tall and matronly, with an elaborate hat on which a fabric bird clung to one side and with a dead fox around her blocky shoulders. Archer had instantly seized on her as the real power, and thus had focused all of his attention there. His contriteness was genuine, his remorse complete. He stared into her large brown eyes and set his peace with heartfelt emphasis contained in each word, until he saw quivering at the corners of those eyes, the false bird and fox start to shake. When he'd finished and then answered all her questions, the consultation among the board was swift and in his favor as the men quickly capitulated to the woman's magisterial decree. And that had been the price of freedom, which he had gladly paid. The Derby Hotel was where the DOP said it would be. Point for those folks, grudgingly. Its architecture reminded him of places he'd seen in Germany. That did not sit particularly well with him. Archer hadn't fought all those years to come home and see any elements of the vanquished settled here. He trudged across the macadam, the collected heat of the day wicking up into his long feet. Though the sky was now dark, it was still cloudless and clear. The air was so dry he felt his skin try to pull back into itself. Archer also thought he saw dust exhaled along with breath. A pair of old withered men were bent over a checkerboard table and congruously perched in the shadow of a large fountain. The thing was built principally of gray and white marble, with naked fat cherubs suspended in the middle holding harps and flutes, and not a drop of water coming out of the myriad spouts. With furtive glances, the old men watched him coming. Archer shuffled along rather than walked. For long distances in prison, meaning longer than a walk to the john, you had your feet shackled, and so you shuffled along. It was demeaning, to be sure, and that was the whole purpose behind it. Archer meant to rid himself of the motion, but it was easier said than done. He could feel their gazes tracking him, like silent parasites sucking the life out of him at a distance, him in his cheap wrinkled clothes with his awkward gait. Prison stop. Look out, gents, ex-con shuffling on by. He nodded to them as he and his filthy shoes grew closer to the cherubic fountain and the bent checker-playing men. Neither nodded in return. Poca City apparently was not that sort of place. He reached the harder pavement in front of the hotel, swung the front door wide and let it bang shut behind him. He crossed the floor, the plush carpet sucking him in, and tapped a bell set on the front desk. As its ringing died down, he gazed at a sign on the wall promising shine shoes fast for a good rate. That and a shave and a haircut, and a masculine aftershave included. A middle-aged man with a chrome dome and wearing a not overly clean white shirt with a gray vest over it and faded corduroy trousers came out from behind a frayed burgundy curtain to greet him. His sleeves were rolled up, and his forearms were about as hairy as any archer had ever seen. It was like fat, fuzzy caterpillars had colonized there. His nails could have used a scrubbing, and he seemed to have the same coating of dust as Archer. Yes, he said, running an appraising glance over Archer, and clearly coming away not in any way, shape, or form satisfied. Need a room. Figured that. Rates on the wall right there. You okay with that? Do I have a choice? The man gave him a look while Archer felt for the wrinkled dollars in his pocket. Three nights. The man put out his hand, and Archer passed him the money. He put it in the till and swung a stiff ledger around. Please sign, complete with a current address. 
Do I have to? Yes. Why? It's the law. The law seemed to be everywhere these days. Archer reluctantly took up the chubby pen the man handed him. What's the address of this place? Why? Because that's my current address is why. The man harumphed and told him. Archer dutifully wrote it down and signed his name in a flourish of cursive. The man eyed the signature upside down. That's really a name? Why? You mostly get Smiths and Jones here with ladies on their arms for short stays? Hey, fella, this ain't that kind of a place. Yeah, I know, you're all class. Like the naked babies set in marble outside. Look it, where are you from? Said the man, a scowl now crowding his face. Here and there, now here. The man slid open a drawer and pulled out a fat brass key. Number 610, top floor, elevators that way. He pointed to his left. Stairs, same way. As Archer started off, the man said, wait, don't you have no bags? Wearing them instead of carrying them, replied Archer over his shoulder. He took the stairs, not the elevator. Elevators were really little prison cells, was his opinion. And maybe the doors wouldn't open when he wanted them to. What then? One thing prison took away from you hard and clear was simple trust. He unlocked the door to 610 and surveyed it, taking his time. He had all the time in the world now. After counting every minute of every hour of every day for the last few years, he no longer had to. But still, it was a tough habit to break. He figured he might actually miss it. He checked the bed. Flimsy, squeaky. His in prison had been concrete masquerading as a mattress, so this was just fine. He opened a drawer and saw the Gideon Bible there along with stationery and a ballpoint pen. Well, Jesus and letter writing are covered. He took off his jacket and hung it on a peg, placing his hat on top of it. He slipped out his folding money. He laid the bills out precisely on the bed, divided by denomination. There was not much there after he'd laid out the dough for the room. The DOP had been stingy, but in an effective way. He would have to work to survive. This would keep him from mischief. He wasn't guessing about this. Archer took out his parole papers. It was right there in the very first paragraph. Gainful employment will keep you from returning to your wayward ways and thus to prison. Do not forget this. He continued running his eye down the page. First meeting was tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. sharp at the Polka City Courts and Municipality Building. That was a long name, and it somehow stoked fear in Archer. Of rules and regulations, and too many things for him to contemplate readily, or adhere to consistently. Ernestine Crabtree was her name, his parole officer. Ernestine Crabtree. It sounded like quite a fine name for a parole officer. He opened his window for one reason only. His window had never opened in prison. He sucked in the hot, dry air and surveyed Polka City. Polka City looked back at him without a lick of interest. Archer wondered if that would always be the case no matter where he went. He lay back on the bed, but his Elgin wristwatch told him it was too early to go to bed. Probably too late to get a drink, though number 14 on his DOP don't list was no bars and no drink. Number 15 was no women. So was number 16, at least in a way, though it more specifically referred to no loose women. The DOP probably had amassed a vast collection of statistics that clearly showed why the confluence of parolees and alcohol in close proximity to others drinking likewise was not a good thing. And when you threw in women, and more to the point, loose women, an apocalypse was the only likely outcome. Of course, right now, he dearly wished for a libation of risky proportion. Archer put on his jacket and his hat, scooped up his cash, and went in search of one. And maybe the loose women, too. A man in his position could not afford to be choosy, or withholding of his desires. On his first day of freedom, he deemed life just too damn short for that. Chapter 3 He found it only a short distance from the hotel, 
not on the main drag of Polka City, but down a side street that was only half the length of the one he'd left. But it was far more interesting, at least to Archer's mind. If the main street was for checker playing and marble musical babies, this was where the adults got their jollies. And Archer had always been a fan of the underdog with weaknesses of the flesh, considering how often he fell on that side of the ledger. The marquee was neon blue and green, with a smattering of sputtering red. He hadn't seen the likes of such since New York City, where it had been ubiquitous. Yet he hadn't expected a smidge of it in Polka City. The cat's meow. That's what the neon spelled out along with the outline of a feline, in full, luxurious stretch that seemed erotic in nature. To Archer, Polka City was getting more interesting by the minute. He pushed open the red door and walked in. The first thing he noted was the floor, planked and nailed, and slimed with the slop of what they'd been serving here since the place opened, he reckoned. His one shoe stuck a bit, and then so did the other. Archer compensated by picking up the force of his steps. The next thing of note was the crowd, or the size of it anyway. He didn't know the population of the town, but if it had any more people than were in here, it might qualify as a metropolis. The bar nearly ran the length of one wall, and like on the bows of old ships, sculpted into the corner support posts of the bar were the heads of exposed bosoms of women, he supposed loose ones, and every stool had a butt firmly planted on it. Against one wall, fiddling guitar players plucked and strummed, while one gal was singing for all she was worth. She had red curly hair, a pink freckled face, and slim hips with stiff dungarees on over them. Her notes seemed to hit the ceiling so hard they ricocheted off with the force of combat shrapnel. Behind the bar was a wall of shelves holding every type of bottled liquor Archer had ever seen, and then some, by a considerable margin. He reckoned a man could live his whole life here and never grow thirsty, so long as the coin of the realm kept up. Indeed, happening on this place after being behind bars this morning and enduring a long, dusty bus ride, and encountering less than friendly citizens hereabouts, Archer considered he might be in a dream. With three years of probation to endure, he felt like a large fish with a hook in its mouth. He could be yanked back at any moment, and that lent force to a man's whims. Thus, he decided to take full advantage while he could. Sidling up to the bar, he wedged in between what seemed a colossus of a farmer with a rowdy beard and hands the width of Archer's head, and a short, thick, late fifties-something, slick-haired banker type in a creamy white three-piece suit far nicer than Archer's. He also had a knotted blue and white striped tie with reptile leather two-toned shoes on his feet, a fully realized smirk in his eye, and a woman less than half his age on his arm. Resting on the bar in front of the man was a flat-crowned Panama hat with a yellow band of silk. Archer caught the bartender's attention and held up two horizontally stacked fingers and tacked on the words, bourbon, straight up. The gent, old, spent, and thin as a strand of rope, nodded, retrieved the liquor from the vast stacks, poured it neat into a short glass, and held it out with one hand, while the other presented itself palm up for payment. It was a practiced motion that a man like Archer could appreciate. How much you charging for that? he asked. Fifty cents for two fingers. Take it or leave it, son. What's the bourbon again, Pops? Only one bourbon in these parts, young feller. Rebel yell. Wheat, not rye. You don't like rebel? You best pick another type of alcohol or another part of the state. Give me an answer, because I ain't getting any younger, and I got thirsty folks with folding money want my attention. Rebel sounds fine to me. He passed over the two quarters and settled his elbows on the bar with the short glass cupped in both hands. He hadn't had a drink in a while. He'd banged one back the day before prison, just for good luck, so he reckoned it was a certain symmetry to have one the day he left prison. He was into balance, if nothing else these days, and moderation, too, until it proved inconvenient, which it very often did to a man like him. The banker eyed Archer while his lady ran her tongue over full lips, painted as warm a red as a sky hosting a setting sun. You're not from here, said the banker. 
His silver hair was cut, combed, and styled with the precision available only to a man who had the dollars and leisure time for such tasks. His face was as flabby as the rest of him, and also tanned and creased with lines in a way that women might or might not find attractive. For such a man, the thickness of his wallet, and not the fitness of his torso, was his main and perhaps only aphrodisiac for the ladies. I know I'm not, replied Archer, sipping the rebel and letting it go down slow, the only way to drink bourbon, or so his granddad had informed him. And not only informed, but demonstrated on more than one occasion. He tipped his hat back, turned around, bony elbows on the bar, his long torso angled off it, and studied the banker, then flitted his gaze to the lady. The banker's smirk broadened. He was reading Archer's mind, no doubt. I like this town, said the banker, and everything in it. He patted the ladies behind, and then his hand remained perched there. She seemed not to mind, or else had grown accustomed to this fondling, or both. As the man's fingers stroked her, she took a moment to powder her nose while looking in a mirror attached to a shiny compact. The lady next shook out a tube of lipstick from her clutch purse and repainted her mouth before once more taking up what looked to be a murky martini with three fat olives lurking mostly below the surface, like gators in a bog. Been in Poker City long, have you? inquired Archer. Long enough to see what's good and what needs changing, and then changing it. He closed his mouth and eyed Archer from under tilted tufts of eyebrow. You gonna keep me in suspense, said Archer finally. The banker laughed and swallowed some of his whiskey. His eyes flickered just a bit as the drink went down, like wobbly lights in a storm. Archer's mouth eased into a smile at this weakness, but the man didn't seem to notice or care. Poker's growing. This used to be just cattle land and farming. Now that's changing. Business and money coming in. Not too much riffraff. How do you decide about riffraff? See, I might fall into that category. And then where do we go with this happy conversation? The lady laughed at this, but the banker did not. She shut her mouth and sipped her bog. The banker intoned, Fact is, a man can make money here if he's willing to work. With the war over, we have winners and losers. I aim to make certain poker falls on the winner's side of the ledger. See, I was here before the war, trying to make things work. Place was an armpit then. Now the country is rebuilding. Hell, we're putting the bricks and glass back up all over Europe, too. Had that damn Berlin airlift feeding all them folks. Commies taking over in China. That Stalin fella getting half of Europe under his iron thumb and testing them damn nuclear bombs. Now, Truman said we'd all be getting a fair deal here, but I don't take no man's word for that, president or not. Folks are heading west again, making their way to new lives, new fortunes. And in poker, we're sort of at the crossroads of all that, betwixt old America, where most now still live, and new America that lies west of here. People pass through, some stay. Most keep going because we can't compete with the likes of Los Angeles and Frisco and that gambling haven in Las Vegas. But opportunities still abound here, and I'm well positioned to take advantage of every one of them, and I am, by God. Archer listened to all this, nodding, his mouth twitching back and forth as he processed the man's many words. He said, saw the fountain with the babies, and the geezers playing checkers. Kind of odd sight. The man laughed. Old and the new. Before long, there won't be time for people to be sitting around playing checkers. No water coming out the fountain, though. We've had a drought, the man said. For a long time now. People gonna come to a place where there's no water? Not if your livelihood depends on raising cattle and crops. That's why we're changing our ways. We use the water for drinking and bathing and such, and not cattle and crops, we'll be fine. You know how damn much a cow drinks? He laughed. Archer nodded and took another sip of the rebel and let it slide down his throat like lava over fresh dirt. I guess I can see that, he replied. 
Look, where are you coming in from? A seven-hour slow, dusty bus ride from the east. The banker squinted as he calculated. That's a fair stretch of road, mister. I figure you for a banker type, but I'd like to be sure. Why, you looking to rob me? They all three had a laugh at that, but Archer's died out before the other two had finished guffawing. Archer glanced at the woman, who was doing the tongue-on-lip thing again. She was in her late twenties, with silky dark hair and a Veronica Lake peekaboo. The sheet of hair fell off the side of her head like a waterfall at night, which contrasted sharply with her pale complexion. Archer could smell her scent across the span of the banker's cologne. It was spicy and warm, and tapped something in him that prison had never inspired. She had on a tight, late-day, thunder-blue dress with a wide, deep neckline that revealed things she evidently wanted to reveal, and a black dog-leash belt encircling her small waist. She had on white wrist-length gloves and a matching narrow-brimmed hat with a small bow. Her heels were high enough to muscle her calves. She wore a small necklace with a rock of diamond in the center. She kept fingering it like she wanted to make sure it was still there. Archer slowly drew his gaze away from her. So you came here all those years ago and the town starts to make something of itself at the same time. Am I to imply a connection? The other man chuckled. I like you. I like how you handle yourself. Man favors a compliment, same as a woman, said Archer, tipping his hat at the lady. Fact is, I've been instrumental in putting Poker City on the map. Got my finger in all the pies worth anything. Saw its potential, you could say. And now that potential is being realized. The man ran his gaze over Archer's long, broad-shouldered, muscular frame. You look like you can handle yourself just fine. Bet you were in the army. I did my bit. About three years without ever seeing America once. Why? A strong and brave man, then, who knows how to survive difficult circumstances. Which means you're just the hombre for me. He took out a wad of cash as big as any fist Archer had ever made in prison or seen coming his way. The man trimmed five twenties off the pile and laid the bills on the bar within easy reach. Archer made no move to pick them up. Well, said the man. Fellow hands out cash like that, something's expected. I'm just waiting on details. The man guffawed again and slapped Archer on the shoulder a bit harder than was necessary. He immediately grimaced and shook out his hand. Damn, you made of rock or what, soldier? Or what, said Archer. I like to pay for potential, and I trust my instincts. Maybe we can do some business. Archer still did not pick up the money. He finished the last finger of his drink and set it down. He said nothing, and neither did the man, for a bit. All around them, gazes flitted to this little group and then away. Maybe it was the money in plain sight. Maybe it was something of a visceral nature between the two men, with the woman hanging on as the lovely sidekick to whatever was going on here. The man took his time removing a cigar from his pocket, efficiently slitting the cellophane band with a switchblade, trimmed the end with the same tool, put the knife away, dropped the cellophane on the bar. The bartender swept it up and then he lit the cigar with a platinum lighter. He puffed luxuriously on the stogie a couple times until it was drawing properly, put the lighter away, and eyed Archer, who had been watching the deliberateness of the man's actions with fascination. The man held up the smoke and said, This here's from Cuba, finest in the world. I like all my things that way. Archer glanced once more at the woman. I can see that. Now to business. You can do a job for me. That money there will be your payment. I'm listening. A man owes me something. I'd like you to collect it for me. What man and what something? His name is Lucas Tuttle. Lives down the roadways. And the something is his Cadillac. Why does he owe that to you? I made him a loan and he failed to repay it. The caddy is the collateral. Maybe he forgot. These things happen. The man pointed to the cash. Hundred dollars. Take it or leave it. He tapped his ash free right on the wood grain of the bar. 
the skinny bartender once more swooped in and cleared the mess with a cloth. Archer snagged an ashtray from in front of the big farmer who was draining highballs at an alarming rate. He placed it right under the fellow's stogie, drawing a sneer from the banker man. Archer said, I have to know some more. Like, how do I know he owes you anything? I go there and take his car, that's stealing. You go to the joint for that in a heartbeat. You understand me? So I need to know if you're giving me a bum steer or what. The man nodded appreciatively. I like a man who's cautious. I'm one myself. He glanced at his lady. Am I not cautious, Jackie? He gave her right buttock a hard squeeze that made her wince a bit, and then removed his hand. The creature named Jackie glanced at Archer, maybe to show she still counted for something here, and then dutifully turned her attention to her man before saying, Cautious as a young woman with a drunken man in close proximity. Her voice was surprisingly husky and assured. It starkly emboldened every fantasy of her Archer was holding. The man perched his cigar in the ashtray and pulled something from his pocket. It was a mess of wrinkled papers. He unfolded and straightened them out, placing them on the bar. On the pages was a swath of tiny printed writing. This is a promissory note for $5,000. See, this is the amount I loaned Tuttle in good faith and everything. Man needed the money, and he came to me. I loaned him the cash from my own pocket. You can see the amount here and his signature there. Now on this page, he flipped through to a second one. This is the security that I required for the loan and which he provided. You read your way right down there. He paused. Hold on. You can read, can't you? Things might not work out between us if you can't. I can read said Archer, with a touch of impatience because he was feeling it. He even did two years of college before the war came calling. He caught the woman's eye on this. She seemed to be calculating him in a new and maybe more favorable light. He ran his eye over the paper. 1947 Cadillac Series 62 sedan painted dark green. And the license plate number is listed. The man pointed to the page. That's right. That's the collateral for the loan that was not repaid. That's what I want you to get for me. Archer scratched his chin. Okay, got a question. Shoot. Nothing personal, but how do I know he didn't repay you? Now you're thinking. I like that. Well, here's how. If the man had paid the loan, this note would be returned to him. Fact that I still got it shows that never happened. Tuttle's a smart man and he'd never have let his money go without getting this in return. See, this is the same as cash money, mister. Same as those five twenties right there. And you see the date the loan was due. He shuffled back to the first page and stabbed at a line with his finger. Right there, you read that, go on. Archer did so, doing the numbers in his head. That date's exactly two months ago yesterday. That's right. Got me another question. You like your questions, said the man, and Jackie giggled. How come it's two months past due and you don't have the money or the caddy yet? You don't strike me as a man overly full of generosity. The man looked at Jackie. This gent is a keeper, Jackie, I'm telling you. Jackie commenced shooting admiring glances Archer's way and giggled once more. She your wife? asked Archer, though he saw no ring on her. I got me a wife. But she ain't it, said the man offhandedly. Jackie's giggle died in her throat as she glanced, embarrassed, at Archer. She took a sip of her gator bog drink and said, There's no need to be like that. The man glanced at her, a look on his mug that Archer had seen many times before on gents, especially in bars, and one he had never once liked. Did I ask for your opinion, sweet cheeks? Well, no, but... His hand shot out, gripped a wrist, and squeezed. Then keep it to your goddamn self, you hear me? Archer tensed and was about to jerk the man's hand off her when he caught a look from Jackie that silently pleaded with him to do no such thing. Archer relaxed back against the bars. the fellow gave Jackie's wrist one more grind, then flung her hand away as he drilled her with a look of quiet satisfaction. Just so we understand each other, honey. 
He turned back to Archer like nothing had just happened. So? Asked Archer expectantly, masking his anger. The truth is I've tried to collect on this debt, only Mr. Tuttle is not amenable to honoring the debt. And how many men have you paid a hundred dollars to try for you? Well, I will concede that you are not the first. The exact number I prefer to keep private. But I will say that Lucas Tuttle is not a man you want to crowd. And suppose I try and fail. Do I keep the money? Depends on the effort expended. I mean, you can't just waltz on down the road and make a feeble attempt at obtaining my collateral and then expect to get the cash, now can you? I don't expect so, no. Then you would be the judge of that? I would be, but I'm a reasonable man. Wouldn't be in business for long if I weren't. And if I failed your expectations, I'd have to give this back? Well, the fact of the matter is, soldier, till you deliver me the car or show me the efforts you undertook to my reasonable satisfaction, you don't walk out of here with that money. I just put it there as what they call an inducement. Supposing I have expenses in gaining back your collateral, how am I to pay for them with nothing up front? You see my problem? What sort of expenses? Till I see the lay of the land and this Mr. Tuttle in particular, how should I know? The man looked warily at Archer then at the money, and then back at Archer. You're the first one to lay out that issue. Well, I'm looking ahead. Maybe I get this done for you. There's more opportunity for me in Poker City, like you said. How much front money are we talking about then? Asked the man warily. I'd say two Jacksons would do amply. The man picked up a pair of bills and handed them to him. I'm placing my faith in you. Now see here, what's your name, soldier? Aloysius Archer. That's a heck of a name. You go by your Christian name, son? Archer shook his head. Too hard to spell and most folks can't pronounce it. I go by Archer. The man put out his hand. I'm Hank. Hank Piddleman. Well, Mr. Piddleman, let me see what I can do. Now, if I get the car for you, doesn't that mean he gets that paper you showed me marked paid? So do I need to take that with me? Piddleman smiled took a long puff on his stogie and shook his head. Oh, no, that's not how this works, Archer. Squinting through the man's wispy curtain of cigar smoke, Archer said, well, tell me how it does work then. Like your expenses, how can I know what I'm gonna get for a 1947 Cadillac? I might get 5,000 for it, though I sure as hell doubt it. I was crazy in the head for not asking for more collateral. He glanced here at Jackie. Maybe my heart is just too soft. The point is, Archer, even if a miracle happened and I got some poor sucker to fork over five grand for the caddy, the debt still isn't paid in full because there's interest on top. I got to make a profit on my money. You see that, don't you? Money neither is nor should be free. I always like to make a profit off my money, too. He rubbed his fingers over the twenties. Say I sell the caddy for 3000 then Tuttle still owes me another 2000 plus interest, plus my incidental costs of collection. He tapped the pile of twenties. Like this. Adds up. Mr. Tuttle has dug himself one deep hole. A smile creased Piddleman's face. Hell, I didn't make him take my money, did I? You have his address and directions there? I don't know the area. Fiddleman took out a thick pencil and wrote something down on a bar napkin and slid it over to Archer. When do you expect to do this then? He asked, pocketing the pencil. Soon. What does soon mean? Pretty soon. He put the twenties in his jacket pocket. Fiddleman watched this move. Now, so you know, I have technically just made a loan to you though not a scrap of paper has passed between us to legally memorialize that arrangement, but my money has long strings attached, same as Tuttle's, and I demand honesty and integrity in my associates. Expect the same of myself. Well, I aim to deliver both, Mr. Piddleman. In response, Piddleman drew the switchblade from his coat pocket once more, sprung it open, and speared the remaining twenties lying there, pinning them to the wood of the bar. 
The knife quivered there like a pine tree in the wind. I'll hold you to that. Archer didn't even look at the blade of the stabbed twenties. Now where can I reach you most times? Right here at this time will do. Every day except Saturday and the Sabbath. And then you'll be at worship? No. Then I'll be with my dear beloved wife. Piddleman suddenly clutched his head and grimaced in pain. Hey, you okay? Asked Archer, gripping him by the shoulder. Must be all this cheap hooch. Recovered, Piddleman unpinned his knife and thrust it back inside his pocket after closing it. I trust I will hear good news from you, Archer. Archer tipped his hat, first to Jackie and then to Piddleman. I will do my best. For me, you will, you mean. Well, can you see it any other way? Archer headed to the door while most of those at the bar, and Piddleman and Jackie in particular, watched him go. He was no longer shuffling. He was walking upright, springy and brisk, like any free man with serious folding money in his pocket would.